coming up on the Ultimate Health Podcast. So what is it about smoking? What is it about asbestos? What is it about certain types of viruses that cause these genes to move from a sort of multicellular organism state, normal state, to these cells becoming a sort of survivalist? That is, you activate the core of your survivalist programming. And the answer is that certain types of damage, so it has to be chronic and it has to be sublethal. And the, the reason it has to be sublethal is because if you have a single sort of catastrophic event, everything dies. And when everything dies, cancer doesn't survive either. So it has to be sort of sublethal. And it has to be chronic because that's what happens in evolution. Evolution is not a single one-time thing. That is, if you have a single shock, like, you know, a meteor falls and everything just dies. It's too overwhelming and too, it simply is not there on a long enough basis to exert a selection pressure. So any type of chronic sublethal damage, in fact, when you look at almost any type of chronic sublethal damage, it can cause cancer. Hello and welcome to the Ultimate Health Podcast, episode 380. I'm Jesse Chappis, and I'm here to take your health to the next level. Each week, I'll bring you in-depth conversations with health and wellness leaders from around the world. And this week, I'm speaking with Dr. Jason Fung. He's a physician, author, and researcher. His groundbreaking science-based books about diabetes and obesity, The Diabetes Code, The Obesity Code, and The Complete Guide to Fasting have sold hundreds of thousands of copies and challenged the conventional wisdom that diabetics should be treated with insulin. This conversation is based off Dr. Fung's latest book, The Cancer Code, a revolutionary new understanding of a medical mystery. Believe it or not, we're almost 400 episodes into the show, and cancer isn't a subject we've really went deep on yet. So Jason came on the show today and did just that. He took a complex subject, broke it down, made it easy for us to all understand, and I know you're going to love this. Highlights include the eight hallmarks of cancer, the truth behind the high price of cancer drugs, nutrition in cancer, how obesity is a big risk factor for cancer, and how the entire cancer field is changing. So many people these days are impacted by cancer, either directly, or if not, most of us at least know somebody in our life that has cancer or had it. So after you're done having a listen, I'd really appreciate it if you could share this episode with somebody in your life that could benefit from the information. Thank you. Without further ado, here we go with Dr. Jason Fung. Jason, welcome back to the podcast. It's great to have you on. Oh, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. We're going to have a great discussion today. I really love the new book, The Cancer Code. And I got to admit, when I dug into the book, it wasn't really what I expected. I was thinking it would be more along the lines of fasting and how that could help prevent, maybe treat cancer, given your background in fasting. But it was so much more than that. I mean, that would have been a great book, but this goes really deep into cancer and, and the evolution of our thinking of cancer over so many years. So congrats. I really enjoyed this. Oh, thank you very much. And I think that's sort of when I started looking at the issue of cancer, that was sort of how I got into it, which is why, you know, most people I would think think it's going to be about all about sort of fasting and nutrition and cancer. But as I dug sort of deeper into the topic of cancer, there's just so much else going on, because clearly cancer is a much more broad problem than just nutrition, because we know things like smoking, for example, it has nothing to do with nutrition, what you eat, if you smoke, your risk of cancer just goes way, way up. Same with asbestos, for example, you exposed to asbestos, it doesn't really matter what you eat, you know, you're at great risk of developing a mesothelioma, which is a type of lung cancer. So that's sort of, well, it was sort of how I got into it. As it developed, as I was looking through, it more became uh, more and more the question, which is never really answered, and I think that is really important, is the sort of how we think about what this problem really is. That is, what is cancer? And that's, I think, one of the greatest remaining medical mysteries because most of these other diseases that we face, we sort of know what's causing them. So even when we get a new virus like COVID-19, for example, within a few months, we've got this virus, like, you know, it's still kicking our butt, but 
we've sequenced it. We figured it out. It's this is the virus. This is the sequence. You know, the DNA sequence. This is how it gets in. We've said, okay, it's the ACE two receptors. You know, you get this cytokine storm. So we know like so much about it, even within sort of six months of this sort of brand new disease coming up, which is great. It's fascinating because something like HIV, for example, it took us years to figure out the actual virus going from AIDS to HIV to sort of treatment. Whereas now, we, you know, 30, 40 years down the line, we figured out what this virus looks like. We figured out, you know, where it attaches. We figured out so much stuff so quickly. But the problem is that with cancer, what is this disease? Like, it's such a strange disease because it's a common disease. It's the second biggest killer of Americans. Yet, if you were to ask the question of what is this disease, most people have no idea. Most experts have no idea. Like, you ask the American Cancer Society, and it says, well, it's a, a disease of genetic mutations. And that's not really correct because if it was simply a matter of genetics, that is, uh, you know, just bad luck genetically, then why does the environment play such a huge role in this genetic disease? That is, if you have a disease such as, say, cystic fibrosis, sickle cell anemia, you know, all these genetic diseases, they get passed on sort of mother to child, or they have a significantly higher risk, and we can identify the genes that are associated with it. On the other hand, it doesn't matter if you're Japanese, if you're African, if you're Caucasian, uh, if you smoke, you're much more likely to get lung cancer. So it's not a genetic disease in that sense. And yet, people have been saying it's a genetic disease, genetic disease. And the problem with that is that if you don't understand what causes it, your research sort of goes in the wrong direction. That is, we've been looking for these genetic mutations, and the progress in cancer has really slowed to a halt. Like if you think about how many genetic sort of cures for cancer we have, it's very, very few. Like the number of medications that makes a difference to cancer, you could sort of count on one hand. And most of those were developed in the early part of the sort of late 90s, early 2000s, right? So that was 20 years ago. And where's all these great genetic cures for cancer? We just don't see them. And it's because it's not merely a genetic disease. And we have to sort of understand further why. And this is this book is really an exploration of how the way we think about cancer has changed over the last little bit, because there's been a huge paradigm shift from being a genetic disease to more of an ecological evolutionary disease, which has huge implications for treatment. Let's go back way back to the beginning and talk about the earliest cases in history of a human having cancer. How far back does that go? Yeah, it goes right back to the beginning. So really, in some of the earliest mummies that have been sort of excavated, we can find uh, cancer. So really, as far as we can tell, it goes back right to the beginnings of humanity. In fact, and this is one of the things that sort of spurred more research into this line of thinking, is that when you look at it very closely, cancer actually goes much further back than humanity. So if you're rooting around in human genes, trying to find what caused cancer, you're not going to find it because it goes way back. It goes back in evolutionary time right to the beginning of multicellular life. That is, you know, it's not just humans that get cancer. Dogs get cancers, cats get cancers, rats get cancers. And even the smallest, most primitive multicellular life forms, they recently identified a hydra, which is a small sort of microscopic being, like uh, we used to study them in high school biology. You'd look at them on the microscope and so on. And even these very, very primitive multi-celled animals, they even get cancer. So what you're talking about is a disease which, you know, its span is much more than just humans. You have to go way, 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 way back to the beginnings of multicellular life in order to find out and answer that question of what is cancer. And at what point was it that humans really got interested in doing research on cancer and, and that whole field really kicked into high gear? If you sort of trace it, what happened is that there was the sort of three great modern paradigms of cancer. So 
you know, people have always been interested in the question of what is cancer? You know, what is a strange disease that is actually derived from our own cells? That is, it's not some extrinsic invader like like COVID-19, like a bacteria. It's, you know, that's something foreign to us that attacks us. And we can understand that. That's very easy to understand. But, you know, if you have a lung cancer, that lung cancer cell was derived originally from your own body, your own normal, you know, healthy liver or lung or whatever cell you have. So why did it suddenly turn cancerous? Not suddenly, but why did it turn cancerous? And what increases that risk? So people have always been interested in it. And the ancient Greeks, um, you know, thought about all diseases in this sort of imbalance of humors. That is, it was a uh, too much black bile. That was their theory of what cancer is. It's an outcropping of excess of black bile. Turns out it wasn't true, of course. But the Greek physician Hippocrates, who's sometimes called the father of modern medicine, actually named the cancer the disease using the Greek word karkinos for crab, which is actually quite an interesting choice of words because of its one sort of impenetrable shell, that is, it's really hard to treat, and two, its ability to sort of move all around the, you know, scuttle around the body or metastasize. So very interesting and very appropriate choice of uh, words. So fascinating. You know, that fell into sort of disuse. And then by the 1800s, people thought about it being a degeneration of your lymphatic fluid, which again was not true, but on the other hand, very perceptive in that it made people think about that it was part of our own body that had somehow become perverted. And then with the advent of the microscope, we could actually see that it's a cellular disease, that is certain cells look very, very strange. That is, these cancer cells look a little bit like normal cells, but a lot different than a normal cell. And we started to identify what part of the cell is different. So you could look under a microscope when you do a biopsy and say, well, this is a cancer cell because it looks completely different, even though there are some very, very basic similarities. Like for example, a breast cancer cell will have estrogen and progesterone receptors just like a normal breast cell. So it can respond to certain hormones, for example, or prostate cancer will have certain features that look like normal prostate cells but it is obviously uh, quite, quite different. The next step sort of was to say, okay, well, we can tell that it's a cellular disease and it's a, a disease where these cells really are just growing too much, right? That's sort of what cancer is. You have a mass, which is called a tumor, a mass of cells that just grows and grows even though it shouldn't. So, you know, a normal lung cell, it's very tightly controlled. Your lung does not just keep growing in size until it pushes your you know, neck off its shoulders kind of thing, right? Everything has to fit in the proper way. And that's the way multicellular life exists because everything has to be very well coordinated between all the cells. You cannot have one cell that just keeps growing or moving wherever it wants because it's going to impact the other cells and then the whole organism will suffer. So as a cell, so that was the first great paradigm of cancer, is this sort of disease of cells that just grow too much. And therefore, the treatment is to kill them. So what we did was we developed ways to kill cells. So we developed surgery, which has been around a long time. If, you know, if it looks abnormal, cut it off. So the next step in the 1900s was radiation, where people said, okay, well, look, we can use radiation, we can burn these cells, and it will do very well. So they treated certain uh, cancers, and they did very well. And then the third thing we did was we developed chemotherapy, which is a form of poison. It's a selective toxin. That is, it is a toxin that kills cancer cells slightly faster than it kills regular cells. So therefore, you can exploit this difference in toxicity in order to selectively destroy cancer. So these three basic sort of uh, treatments for cancer we've had since the sort of at least the 1940s when chemotherapy, the last sort of modality, was really developed. And they sort of form the basis of most of modern cancer therapy, even today, even though it developed in the 1940s. What we've done, of course, is we've found better ways to combine them, better ways to mix the regimen, this cocktail of poison. We've developed slightly safer ways to administer these poisons. 
But the idea is the same. The paradigm is the same. These are all ways to kill cells. It worked very well, but it started to reach the limits of what you could do with this paradigm. And the problem with this paradigm of a cell that grows too much is that it doesn't answer the sort of next deeper level of understanding, which is why are these cells growing too much? Because until you understand that, you can't figure out what the next sort of treatment paradigm is going to be. And this sort of developed through the 60s, 70s. So the DNA was discovered in the sort of 50s by Watson and Crick. And as we developed more and more, we started to understand about genes, about chromosomes, and how these genes really control everything in our bodies. So the way that we grow, the way that our fingers develop, the way that, uh, you know, your heart moves, all that kind of thing is a lot of to do with genes. Certain genes control certain things. And there are growth genes. So there are, you know, genes that tell our body to grow there. And there are genes that tell us to stop growing as well. So we have very tight control of what grows and what doesn't grow. And so the next step was to say, well, here's the answer. We know that there's lots of different things that cause cancer. These are called carcinogens. So we have tobacco smoke and we have asbestos and we have certain viruses that cause a cervical cancer like human papillomavirus. And we said, well, what's the sort of connection between all of these things? Like, why do they all cause cancer, these different things? What's the link? And the link, they said, was genetics. So all of these things cause damage to the cells, damage to the DNA, which can cause genetic mutations. So therefore, if you smoke, you're causing damage to this lung cell, which is causing damage to the DNA, which is causing mutations in that gene. Now, if you happen to hit a critical gene that controls growth, then you're going to have cells that grow out of control. And if the virus, for example, hits a, a critical gene that controls growth, then it also is going to cause this uncontrolled growth. So that was the genetic paradigm. And this is the sort of second big advance, the second great paradigm of the way we think about cancer. This is actually a genetic problem, which is causing the problem of too much growth. So you see, none of this second paradigm is invalidates any of what we thought about the first paradigm. It's simply expanding the knowledge of how those cells came to grow too much. By the 1990s, we started to develop treatments based on this genetic paradigm. And the first few treatments were simply spectacular, like really, really good. So in a disease called uh, chronic myelogenous leukemia, we developed a drug called imatinib, which was based not on killing cells, but on controlling the genetic defect. So in this disease of leukemia, it's chronic myelogenous leukemia, there was a defective protein, which was caused by a specific gene. So rather than just trying to indiscriminately kill cells, what we're going to do is go in there and try and fix this protein. So fantastic. The drug worked better than anybody believed. It was one of the greatest sort of advances in, in oncology. It was just amazing. And shortly thereafter, there was a drug for breast cancer called trastuzumab or Herceptin, which was another huge advance. So again, not all breast cancers but a certain subset of breast cancers. And then what they did was they developed the genetic test to say, hey, if you have this gene mutation, then you will benefit from this drug. And again, just really fantastic results. So by the 2000s, the early 2000s, people were like, this is it. Like cancer is done. We're going to cure cancer because all we're going to need to do is figure out the two or three genetic mutations that each cancer has, develop the two or three drugs that we need to correct these mutations, and cancer is going to be history. Uh, yeah, there will still be some cancers, just like, you know, we have antibiotics, but we can keep sort of refining it. It was sort of this moment in history where most people were super, super optimistic that we had actually finally turned the corner on this war of cancer, right? This war that President Nixon had actually started in the 1970s. So scientists had decided to go all in at this point. 
understandably because of the success. Yeah, the success was just huge. Now, the technology of the time, of course, was relatively limited compared to 2020. So in the 1990s, we had this huge human genome project, which uh, was one of the sort of going to be one of the great scientific wonders of the world. That was the way it was sold. Very expensive, multinational collaboration. And what the plan was, was to sequence all of the genes of the human body. And at the time, of course, it took a lot of time and money. Now you could go to like 23andMe and get it done right in like two days, you'd probably get your genome done. But the computing power wasn't there. So it was a huge task. And we thought, okay, well, we're going to sequence the genes and it's going to lay bare this map of cancer. We just need to look. After that, we just need to look. So colon cancer affects this gene and this gene. After you've developed the drugs, you take this drug and this drug, which blocks those two genetic mutations, boom, you're done. Just like the first couple of drugs seem to do, the trastuzumab and imatinib. And then shortly thereafter, and the Human Genome Project, of course, finished in the year 2000. And then shortly after that, they didn't find all the cures for cancer. So then they embarked on an even more ambitious sort of cancer-specific genome project, which was called the Cancer Genome Atlas. So rather than sequencing a single person, so remember the Human Genome Project was one person's entire DNA, and that took a long time. We weren't going to do that. The technology had advanced way past that. We could do much more. So they're going to take thousands of cancers. So, you know, patient A, patient B, patient C, you know, with colon cancer and then with lung cancer, patient A, patient B, patient C, they're just going to take all of those genomes because remember, all our genomes are different. Yours is different from mine. So they would take everybody's genome. They'd take thousands of these and sequence all these tumor samples. And then by comparing them, they could say, okay, well, look, in colon cancer, these three genes are the only ones that you have to worry about. So that took, you know, another multi-hundreds of hundreds of millions of dollars, multinational collaboration and all this kind of thing. And I think it wrapped up in 2018 and basically the entire thing's been forgotten. Like there's no headlines in the New York Times. There's nobody even knew that it finished. <laughs> they had so lost interest in what this was going to show. Because by that time, the sort of genetic paradigm had already started to collapse. And this is important because the way you look at cancer as a disease influences the treatments that you develop. That is, we were spent so much time and energy developing genetic cures. And what was the problem? The problem was that they didn't find like two or three genetic mutations. What they wound up finding was hundreds and hundreds of mutations. In 2018, I think to that date, they had found about 6 million mutations in cancer. Like 6 million. It was a lot. This idea that you had one or two genes which caused this one disease was way off. So if you had colon cancer, you had like 100 different gene mutations. And worse, the patient sitting next to you, who also has a identical-looking colon cancer, would have 100 genetic mutations that were completely different than your mutations, right? So the whole treatment paradigm, the treatments just fell apart because it's not like you could develop one drug. All of a sudden, one patient A needs 100 different drugs, none of which are available, right? We have like five. But the problem is that you can't use those. Even if you could develop 100 drugs, you'd need 100 different other drugs for the very next person in the chair sitting beside you. So the whole idea was not going to work. It, you know, it started off with a bang, but it just petered out. So all of these sort of miracle cancer cures that you heard about in the early 2000s, when there's all this optimism, they've largely faded away. In fact, you don't hear about it barely at all anymore because for that reason. So when did Paradigm 2 come to a close? It was sort of in the 2000s because there's two things, of course, that you have to do as, as a um, you know, way that you look at cancer. It has to, one, explain why, how cancer develops. And the second thing it's going to have to do is lead to good treatment because otherwise it's not that useful. 
So it needs to lead to understanding and it needs to lead to good treatment. And it failed on both of those sort of things because there was a lot of problems with this genetic paradigm. That is, people said that it was a random genetic mutation. So in fact, the reason you got a mutation in this growth gene, for example, was not because, say, you, you smoke tobacco and you got lung cancer and you affected a specific gene that tends to cause growth. Well, smoking is not a targeted genetic mutation, right? It, it doesn't target anything. It just causes all kinds of damage. So why did this growth gene in specifically get affected? Well, people said, well, it's random, right? It's like, it's just bad luck in the way that if you buy a lot of lottery tickets, you have more chances of winning the lottery. If you smoke, you're going to increase the rate of mutation, and by chance, one of them is going to hit a critical area. So that was the kind of idea that they had. It couldn't explain anything. That is, why did something like asbestos, which is exposed everywhere, cause mesothelioma, and not the regular type of lung cancer like uh, smoking, right? And why did it cause this mesothelioma and not colon cancer or skin cancer or something else? There was something very specific about what was happening, and it wasn't simply a random genetic sort of mutation just by luck. It was missing the specific cause. Yeah, so they were missing the cause of what was causing these mutations, because their answer to what was causing these mutations was that it was just luck. And the other thing is that the rate of mutation, so cancer is a very common disease, unfortunately. If you look at sort of lifetime risk, you're talking probably around one in 10 people are going to get it. The rate of genetic mutation in humans is not nearly the rate that is high enough to sustain sort of one in 10 people getting cancer. It's simply not that high. The rate of mutation generally is very, very low. So it, it couldn't explain a lot of stuff. It couldn't explain how it develops, why all cancers look virtually identical. That is, if you take a, you know, a, um, a Japanese woman in the 1920s compared to an African American woman in the 2020s, you know, opposite sides of the world, completely different genetics. Well, both of them can get breast cancer. And those breast cancers, which have evolved sort of independently from their hosts, look very, very similar. So how does that happen? Like when you have something which evolves, that is you take a normal cell and it goes, you know, forward, it can go forward, it can change in a million different ways. Just like if you have, you know, two children and you say paint something, it's almost inconceivable that they will paint exactly the same thing. So if you take a Japanese woman in the 20s and an African-American woman in the 2020s, you say, okay, now your cell is going to mutate. What are the chances that those two cells are going to mutate into the exact same thing? It's like the chances are almost zero. Yet this was what was happening. So if we had to believe that it's simply a genetic mutation, you have to explain how you can have whole waiting rooms full of people whose cancers have evolved in exactly the same way. It's simply not feasible. Like, you can't do it. It's like saying, okay, you know, you have 50 people and you give them paint and you say, paint something, and every single one of them comes back and paints a picture of a pink elephant. It's like, well, why would everybody paint a pink elephant? Like, there's something happening here that is targeted and is not simply random because somebody will paint a flower and somebody will paint a house, right? It's like that. Same thing with genetic mutations. When you say, okay, mutate, the cells can mutate in any different way. Why would it develop as a cancer? Why wouldn't it mutate so I can shoot like laser beams out of my eyes, right? It's simply, there's no, no a priori reason why certain mutations are favored according to that mutation. And these are some of the questions that sort of led to this sort of next paradigm of cancer, which is developing, which answers a lot of these questions and leads to sort of hopefully more treatments that are more uh, successful in the future. Well, let's get into paradigm three. This is when you have the chronic injury that's sublethal. So talk about when this whole paradigm shift began and what that looked like, the shift into that. It started sort of in the 2000s. And this is, uh, you know, the story that most people don't know about, but has been happening for about probably five or 10 years. So in about 2000, 
two researchers decided to do was to look at what makes cancer cancer. So uh, sometimes this is called the lumper splitter problem. That is when you're grouping things together, you can either lump them into a single category or you can split them into their own category. So if you take mammals, for example, you can say, okay, well, we have whales and we have humans and we have chimpanzees and you lump them all together as mammals. So that's great. You can also split them and say, well, you know, humans and chimpanzees were we're hominids and, you know, we're not, we don't swim. So we're going to split them into two separate categories. So those are the splitters. And they're not right or wrong, but they do different things. So lumpers, when you lump everything into a single category, it emphasizes the similarities between the two. That is, say, we're breathe air as opposed to fish. And when you split them, you emphasize the differences between the two. That is, you know, we live on land, they live on water. And cancer had mostly been uh, sort of splitters. So they would split breast cancer from colon cancer, from stomach cancer, from liver cancer, and it was divided according to the cell of origin. And in 2000, two researchers, Weinberg and Hanahan, decided something very interesting. They would actually look at the similarities as opposed to the differences between the two cancers. They wrote a paper which went on to be sort of the most cited paper in oncology. So probably the most important paper, you know, research paper in oncology. And it was basically laying out the hallmarks of cancer. So what is it that makes cancer cancer? And what was different about it, of course, they were lumpers rather than splitters. Where everybody else was a splitter, they were lumpers. So they put them all together and said, what is it about cancer that makes it different than a normal cell. And they came up with eight hallmarks, and they basically come down to certain things. So one, these cells, they move around. So cancer cells move around. So if you think about a lung cancer, the lung cell does not move around. Like your lung cell does not hop into the blood and go down and hang out with your liver for a little while, right? It stays where it's supposed to stay. So it can't move around. The second thing is that it grows. It grows like crazy. So lung cells, they can't grow. So the number of cells that die off are matched almost exactly by the number of cells that grow. That's why your lung doesn't keep expanding until, you know, it pushes everything out of the way. But lung cancer cells do. So this is another big, important, you know, fundamental difference between cancer cells and normal cells. So they grow, they move around. The third thing is that they're immortal. Now, the paper went into the sort of scientific language of it, but to understand it simply, cells don't live forever. So if you have a cell in your body, like the lung cell, and you take it out of the lung cell, it will only be able to divide a certain number of times before it can no longer divide. So this is called the Hayflick limit, and it's controlled by the telomeres on the ends of the chromosomes. And this was very popular a few years ago. In the anti-aging circles, people talked about telomeres and stuff. But essentially, you can't keep replicating forever. Like one cell will divide a certain number of times, then it's done. And then the fourth thing is that it uses a very peculiar way of generating energy called glycolysis, where normal cells use a different sort of pathway called oxidative phosphorylation. So that was really important because now people started to focus on what is it that makes cancer cancer, which makes it easier to ask the question, what is cancer and how does it differ from normal cells? They grow, they're immortal, they move around, they use glycolysis. The next sort of big step was sort of in the mid-2000s when people started to look around for answers. So the genetic paradigm had sort of run its course. We were all in. We spent hundreds of millions of dollars trying to develop treatments for this sort of genetic paradigm came up with a handful, but none sort of recently. What people needed to know was, again, that next level of understanding. So it's really the next why. You know, the first paradigm was cancer cells or cells that grow too much. But why? Right? And then that was the answer, the genetics. Genetic Uh, mutations cause cells to grow too much. And so the next question then to understand cancer is why? 
why are these genes mutating? And they're not mutating in random ways. They're mutating in very specific ways. And these were the ways they were mutating. They were growing, they were immortal, they were, you know, moving around, and they were using the glycolysis. So the question is, why are they doing that? And this is what led to the idea that people started to say, well, what we have to do is not look just at human genes because that's too narrow. They brought in an astrobiologer actually to sort of give some different thoughts. And his first thought was that this disease goes way, way, way back, right? It goes back past the beginnings of humanity. So let's go back and really look at the differences between unicellular cells and multicellular cells. Remember that our body is composed of small units called cells. So you have liver cells, lung cells, and so on. But the very earliest organisms had a single cell. Say you have a, a game of, say, soccer, and you have single cells. It's just like being a player, right? You're a player, you're on your own. That's it. You don't have to interact with anybody. You don't have to do anything. But you're very limited in what you can do because you have to do everything yourself, right? You have to score. You have to goaltend. You have to do everything. As life on Earth evolved, groups of cells started to get together. And this sort of led to the next big jump, which was a jump from unicellular life to multicellular life. There's a huge advantage to multicellularity which is that you can develop specialization. So you can have forwards and you can have defense and you can have goalies. And each cell, each person can sort of focus on what they do best and leave something for something else. So that's a huge advantage. But there is a fundamental change in the way that you have to be structured. If you're a single cell, you're basically competing with all other cells. When you are part of a sort of team of cells, you have to cooperate. There's a huge difference. So all the genes up until that point of unicellularity were focused on how to survive and compete. That is, other cells were basically the enemy because they were trying to get the same resources you were getting. All of a sudden, when you move into multicellularity, you need to learn how to cooperate. So just like a team. So if you're an individual, all the other players are our opponents. When you get into a team, you have to completely switch your mode of thinking. You have to say, now, how do I cooperate with these other players so that the team is going to be the best? And when you move from unicellular life to multicellular life, you can say, Okay, let's look at these cells and how they are fundamentally different between unicellularity and multicellularity. Well, one, unicellular cells, so unicellular organisms like bacteria or fungi, for example, they grow. They always grow. So if you have fungi on a slice of bread, it will grow until there's no more food. It really doesn't care about anybody else. It's not leaving anything for anybody else. It's just competing for food and it will grow. It will grow as long as it can. That's it. Nothing stops it. The second thing is that these cells are immortal. That is, if you take a bacteria, you can continuously replicate it forever. That's not the case with normal multicellular life because a lung cell, for example, you take it out, put it in a petri dish, it will stop after a certain number of things. Third major thing is that it moves around because, again, if you think about bacteria or fungi, when they exhaust their food source, they got to get somewhere else. So their natural state is to move around because you're always looking for a better source of food or whatever. Whereas multicellular organisms, they need their cells to stick together in a very specific spot. That is, your liver has to be in a certain spot, your lung has to be in a certain spot, your heart has to be in a certain spot for everything to work together, as opposed to that. And then unicellular organisms tend mostly to use glycolysis. So people said, well, look, you know, the way that cancer cells differ from normal cells is exactly the way that cells in a multicellular organism 
differ from unicellular organisms. And that could not have been simply a coincidence because the way that they interact is like these cells all of a sudden, so you, you know, these cancer cells have suddenly turned into unicellular organisms. They're basically out for themselves, right? So they used to be part of a team, but now they've turned, instead of being cooperative, they're sort of on their own, looking out for themselves. This lung cancer cell is nothing like the lung because it's basically after its own survival. That is, it will kill other cells, it will do whatever it takes to survive, it will move around looking for better opportunities, it will metastasize. So it's no longer looking after the good of the individual. And that's, you know, the reason why the thought is that cancer, the disease, is actually a sort of evolutionary process, but not forwards in evolutionary time, backwards towards the unicellular state, right? And that's a very, very interesting thought because it explains so much about why cancers look so similar. You know, just to finish that thought, cancers are so similar because we evolved from single-celled organisms. That seed of that cancer lies in every single one of our cells. And as we move backwards, towards that sort of unicellular sort of destination, everything looks the same. That is to say, if you're to say, okay, well, you know, you have 50 kids in a room, everybody has a painting of a white, you know, a pink elephant. Is it more likely that all those kids just decided to paint a pink elephant? Or did they simply open up the box and a pink elephant was already there? And that's more likely. So that sort of cancer subroutine sort of exists, pre-programmed in every one of us. But as we move from unicellular to multicellular life, that cancer subroutine was never sort of erased. We simply built programs on top of that in order to sort of subvert those tendencies so that we became this sort of team. But under certain types of stress, as you remove all those controls, that cancer subroutine then is allowed to sort of flourish. And of course, that cancer subroutine is not, it's not like something evil. It's, it's simply a survival subroutine, right? It's the most basic survival techniques of our most basic evolutionary past, which is the single cell organism. And explains a lot. So this idea explains so much. It explains why cancers develop in the same way. It explains why cells, when you look at them, are primitive. That is, they look like they're not getting more complicated. They look like they're getting more primitive. When you look at cells, that's how they describe them for the last 50 years in medical pathology. They're primitive cells, they're blast cells, they're sort of de-differentiated, that is, they're losing their specialization, they're going backwards in time, they're very uh, early-looking cells, and explains why almost every single cell in your body can become cancerous. Because it's not a matter of hitting one specific gene, it's the sort of most essential kernel of how that cell developed, not in our lifetime, but many, many, many lifetimes ago. So every single cell can become cancerous, not just in humans, but indeed in all of the animal world. Explains why cancer is so common, because that sort of cancerous subroutine is there, sort of pre-programmed in all of us. But what's important when you start to look at things from an evolutionary standpoint, it leads you to one very important conclusion which is that the most important thing that leads to evolution is not the genetics, it's the environment. That is, it's the ecology. That is, the interaction between an individual and its environment is the most important determinant. Because if you look at you know, cancer, it's estimated that 70-80% of cancer is environmental. That is, smoking, for example. That's something that's environmental. It's not genetic in any of us. 
So instead of just focusing purely on the genes, what we do by looking at it from an evolutionary ecological standpoint is start to look at it in terms of the genes in relationship to their environment. Because you can't control your genes, but you can control your environment, which means that this now gives us hope to go further and say, what is it about our environment that we can change in order to lower our risk of cancer? Because we know that it's largely an environmental disease. Now I'm going to take a quick break from my chat with Jason to give a shout out to our show partner, Organifi. The Organifi Red Juice will provide you with all day organic energy without the caffeine. It's rich in antioxidants and contains superfood ingredients to strengthen your immune system. The ingredients include cordyceps, rhodiola, Siberian ginseng, reishi mushroom, acai, beets, four different berries, and pomegranate. And if you're worried about making this a consistent part of your healthy routine, no need to worry. All you do is mix a scoop of the red juice powder with a glass of filtered water, give it a shake or stir, and you're ready to enjoy. And as a listener of the show, you get 20% off your Organifi purchase by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Organifi. Again, that's ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Organifi. And Organifi is spelled O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I. The red juice powder from Organifi will give you clean energy without the crash of caffeine. Now I'm going to give a shout out to our other show partner, Blue Blocks. If you've been holding off on getting a pair of blue light glasses, don't wait any longer. Blue Blocks has a site-wide Black Friday sale going on right now. You have until the end of the month to save 25% off everything Blue Blocks has to offer. Typically being a listener of the show, you save 15% off your order, which is incredible, but this is a significant discount on top of that. If you're new to blue light glasses, I recommend starting with the Sleep Plus glasses, which eliminate 100% of the blue and green light between 400 and 550 nanometers. And this is the exact range that has been shown in clinical trials to disrupt melatonin and negatively impact our sleep. You just put them on two to three hours before bed and you get optimal results after just one evening's use. To take advantage of this incredible deal, go to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash blueblocks. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash blueblocks. And Blue Blocks is spelled B-L-U-B-L-O-X. On top of that, you get free shipping worldwide on orders over $100. Start sleeping better by getting yourself a pair of the Blue Blocks Sleep Plus glasses and wearing them nightly before bed. P.S. This is a great time to get a pair for everyone in the family. And now back to my chat with Jason. And this ties back to how I opened up Paradigm 3 that stress in the environment has to be chronic and sublethal. We mentioned smoking in here and and talked about that as being one of these carcinogens or stresses. What are some of the other common ones that we're facing today? So tobacco smoke is sort of by far and away the biggest one. The other ones that have been well identified are other chemicals. So asbestos is very common. Silicon is all silicosis is very common. Viruses is another common one. So certain viruses are uh, carcinogenic. So human papilloma virus in uh, cervical cancer, for example, hepatitis B virus, hepatitis C virus are carcinogenic. They cause liver cancer. And then certain bacteria. So Helicobacter pylori, which is a bacteria that resides in the stomach, causes stomach cancer. And that was one of the reasons why we saw such a huge difference, for example, between Asians who had a lot of stomach cancer because they had a lot of H. pylori, and North Americans where the sanitation was better, the sort of there wasn't this overcrowding, people were sort of spread out, so they didn't have a lot of H. pylori, and therefore the rates of stomach cancer were sort of like one tenth of the rate of, say, Japan in the 1950s. And then, as soon as the Japanese people would emigrate to America, their rates of stomach cancers just plummeted because, again, you're not exposed to this chronic stress. So those were the things. And from an evolutionary standpoint, you have to say, well, there's two things that will lead to this evolutionary process. So when you're talking about evolution, you talk about selection pressure. So what is it in the environment that is selecting certain genes and giving them a survival advantage? So in sort of the way Darwin had originally sort of discovered it was that he saw that on this island, the Galapagos, there were certain birds, and some of them had these short beaks, which were really good for eating nuts, and others had these long beaks, which were really good for eating fruit. 
And he saw in the parts of the island that had a lot of fruit, you had a lot of long beaks. And when the part of the island where you had lots of nuts, you had short beaks. So it's not that long beak is better than short beak. It all depends on where you are and what your food source is. It's the environment which selects the genes to develop. So that's why, you know, looking at it from an evolutionary standpoint, it's always the environment that is critical. So what is it about smoking? What is it about asbestos? What is it about certain types of viruses that cause these genes to move from a sort of multicellular organism state, normal state, to these cells becoming a sort of survivalist? That is, you activate the core of your survivalist programming. And the answer is that certain types of damage, so it has to be chronic and it has to be sublethal. And the, the reason it has to be sublethal is because if you have a single sort of catastrophic event, everything dies. And when everything dies, cancer doesn't survive either. So it has to be sort of sublethal. And it has to be chronic because that's what happens in evolution. Evolution is not a single one-time thing. That is, if you have a single shock, like, you know, a meteor falls and everything just dies. It's too overwhelming. And two, it simply is not there on a long enough basis to exert a selection pressure. So any type of chronic sublethal damage, in fact, when you look at almost any type of chronic sublethal damage, it can cause cancer. So you can look at, say, esophageal cancer, stomach acid, which kind of goes back up into the esophagus, which causes heartburn, it's actually well known to cause esophageal cancer. Why? Because you have a chronic sublethal damage to those esophageal cells from the stomach acid. Stomach acid is a perfectly normal substance. It's just in the wrong place. Or if you look at any of the, any of the sort of carcinogens, they're all sublethal toxins. Hepatitis B, hepatitis C, for example, cause chronic low-grade liver damage. Hepatitis A and hepatitis E, on the other hand, cause a single acute episode of overwhelming liver damage, and they don't cause uh, cancer. You know, almost anything that you look at, if you have a single event of high radiation, like a, a nuclear bomb, so they, they studied the survivors of the Japanese Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and they were worried that they'd have a lot of cancer. It turns out they didn't actually have a lot of cancer because it was a single large dose of radiation, not a chronic low-level dose of radiation. And interestingly enough, when you use chronic radiation as you do in radiation treatment to cure cancer, you actually increase the risk of other cancers. So all the treatments of paradigm one, that is surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy, that is cutting, burning, and poisoning, not only do they cure a lot of cancers or treat a lot of cancers, they're also all well-known carcinogens. So the very thing that you're using to treat cancer also causes cancer. That is, most types of chemotherapy cause cancer. The good thing is that they treat the one cancer you're doing first so that you'll survive, hopefully, to get your second cancer. But they're all carcinogens, and that is the reason why. That is the reason why the treatments are actually also a cause of a secondary, they're called secondary malignancies. That is, they, they will cause it. Any chronic sublethal damage is what sets up the environment that leads to this transformation to a sort of cancer state. It's the environment which allows these genes, which allows this sort of survivalist kernel that is cancer to manifest and survive. Let's talk about what happens at that moment in a cell when that threshold is crossed and a cell goes from multicellular functioning normally to unicellular and cancerous. It probably has happening all the time, actually. And this is why our body actually has a number of defenses against cancer. We actually have a innate protection against cancer so our immune system has something called immune surveillance, where it will go around looking for cancer cells, and upon finding them, will instantly destroy them. So that is one of the reasons why if you have an immune-suppressed state, that is if you're taking immune-suppressing medications, like a transplant patient, for example, 
you're at much higher risk of developing cancer because you're not able to get rid of these cancerous cells that are developing. So the way I like to think about it is that our body is sort of like a city, right? We've got all these cells and they live harmoniously together like, you know, a nice city. So there are certain rules and there there are certain rules that apply. That is, you know, you can't just, you, you have your apartment or condo, you can't go trespassing into someone else. You have to wear, you know, pants. You can't just walk around naked all day. You know, there's certain rules you have to follow to be an orderly society. Cancerous cells, because we're like cells in a multicellular organization. So people in a city have to follow certain rules. You line up at the grocery store. You don't just barge in and shove somebody else out of the way. And that sort of environment also has people to enforce the rules. That is, they're policemen and so on. They're firefighters they're for fires. There's all these people that are there to sort of maintain order. What happens during the transformation to cancer is as if the law and order suddenly dissolves, right? And you see this when you have, say, civil war. Nobody knows who's in charge and so on. And all of a sudden, you go from a well-functioning society of cells where there's rules, there are no more rules, and every cell is there for itself, right? And that's the sort of environment that is going to favor the cancerous thing. So just like in a city, so if you have a city, civil war breaks out, what happens? There's looting, there's violence. All of a sudden, those rules that apply no longer apply. And if you want to survive, you need to do something about it. So even if you're not a looter, you're not violent, if you don't wind up trying to get some food or something, you may just die. Your family may just die. So you wind up doing all these things that you normally wouldn't do. You know, it's like this sort of civil unrest. It's sort of like anarchy. And that's what's happening in the sort of tissue is that under the uh, influence of this chronic damage, like smoking, like tobacco, like viruses, there's this no- loss of order, this loss of normal order. And that's when cells have a higher tendency to become cancerous because they're faced between staying where they were, doing what they're doing, but you're going to probably die if you do that or becoming this sort of anarchist, you know, everybody for themselves, lock the doors, go grab some food, like even if it means looting the, the, the store, that's what you have to do to survive. And that's sort of the change, that's the transformation that happens when you go from sort of normal cells to a cancerous cell. But it probably happens all the time, but then the sort of law and order people, the police or the military or whatever, if you will, in that analogy, come in and they restore order. So this probably happens all the time. And our immune system performs that function, comes in, sees that there's oh a couple of sleeper cells of cancer cells and wipes them out before you even know it. It's interesting because, again, it explains a few things that we've we've seen over the years, that is, there are certain cases of cancer where people have survived 20, 30 years with this, with a cancer, and then all of a sudden it grows again. It's like, how does the cell survive 20 or 30 years? And it's like, it probably survived in equilibrium. That is, it was strong enough to survive, but not strong enough to expand. The anti-cancer forces and the cancer forces are equally matched so that it stays small. But anything that tips the balance against those anti-cancer forces allows cancer to grow. So the biggest one is probably age. So with age, the immune system often starts to weaken. And in those cases, cancer cells, and of course, you're getting more damage to those cancer cells, may start to grow. The interesting thing about this whole situation is the cells are making that transformation based on survival. And in the end, when they transform you know, going back to a more primitive form and cancer takes over the body, the person ends up dying in the end and the cancer doesn't survive in the end. Yeah, it's interesting. And that's often a question people have asked is like, why would a cancer develop to be so lethal? Because it's going to kill itself in the process. That is, if you have a very bad cancer, that cancer will kill you and then the cancer itself will die. Why? Like that doesn't (laughs) seem to make sense. But Again, it's just like those uh, sort of warlords and so on. 
when they get into that state where they're sort of fighting for survival, at some point it's so maladaptive that they will just die. But they don't care because they're not looking towards the future. They're just looking to survive that instant in time. And that's why they don't plan to go any further. Just like a bacteria. And it's exactly like a a single-celled organism. So if you look at a bacteria, you put it in a sort of a nutrient broth or something like that, or you grow it, or if you have a, a yeast on a slice of bread, it will continue to grow until everything is eaten up. There's none of this, oh, let's save some because, you know, it'll be smart if we don't grow and we just kind of go along. That would be the smart thing to do. That's what, not what things are because there's no coordination, right? It's every cell for cell. Everybody for himself. And that ultimately is destructive when you're looking at it from a sort of a multicellular point of view. In the end, this sort of cancer actually kills itself. But you can understand why it would do that by looking at it more from a, you know, like, like this is a sort of almost a separate species, right? Because I find this really interesting because you have to look at the cancer almost like a separate species. It's almost not like a lung cell or a liver cell or a pollen cell anymore. It's like it branched out and made its own species like a bacteria because that's how the immune system actually sees that cancer. It actually sees it and identifies it as foreign. It doesn't identify it as part of our own cells. It actually identifies our own immune system, looks at this cancer cells and says, that's a foreign invader. Let's kill it. So that's what keeps it in check for a long time and explains why cancer actually has so much more in common with the way we treat infectious diseases. That is, infectious diseases, they continue to grow, they metastasize. So when you're talking about metastatic disease, we talk about cancer because these, you know, a lung cancer can metastasize and go into the, so the lung can spot on the lung can go into your brain, for example. And the same with the bacteria. So you have infections and they're metastatic as well. So an infection in your heart valve will easily metastasize and go into your brain. Whereas a heart attack will never go anywhere. Like you don't get a heart attack and then it metastasizes. If you get a cut on your leg, it doesn't suddenly become a cut on your face, right? It doesn't do that. But you have to almost treat the disease almost like an infectious disease and try to kill it. In the same way we have uh, cocktails of regimens for certain bacteria, we have cocktails of chemotherapy for that because it's almost like a separate new species that has developed in our own body. When you're talking about chemotherapy and treatment for cancer, this is one part of the book I was really blown away by, the cost of these drugs and treatments and how they've gone up over the years. So talk about where we're at right now with cost and what somebody would expect if they're diagnosed with cancer. Yeah, it's a sort of, sort of sad part of the of the whole thing is that the costs of treatment have gone way up. And you might say, well, these drugs are expensive, but unfortunately, that's only part of the story. So the first drug of that sort of new genetic paradigm was imatinib, which was a great drug. They priced it quite high for the time. And what happened over the ensuing years was sort of unprecedented. So the way that drugs had been in the past is that you'd price them, and for about 10 years, you had copyright protection, so nobody could copy you, but then generics would come in, and they would lower the price. So if you look at, say, a blood pressure medication, it would start off being very expensive, and about 10 years later, 15 years later it would drop to like 5% of the original cost, right? So if a drug costs 10 bucks originally or 20 bucks for a month, 10, 15 years later, it would cost like $2 for a month of medication. So that's the way most drugs had been. Cancer, um, I think they decided that instead of dropping the drugs, they just kept raising the prices. And it was because I think the market was willing to pay it because these were such great drugs and there's this new paradigm of treatment. So the very same drug, matinib, which in sort of 2000 cost, you know, a few thousand dollars, all of a sudden the price just went up and up and up. And so for the very same drug, so no extra, you know, development cost, nothing like that. For the very same drug, it was three, four times the cost. And then other drug developers looked at that and said, okay, so when they came time to introducing this sort of 
generic medications, they didn't drop the price. Instead of saying, okay, we're going to come in at a price which is 10% of the original cost. They came in and said, we're going to introduce a generic and it's going to cost actually a little bit more than the original. It was like, what? <laughs> That's crazy. But if everybody colludes, like all the drug companies collude to keep the prices high, then the prices stay high because you have no other choice. You're stuck. As a uh, group of consumers, we have no choice because we, we need those medications. So the companies, just instead of, it's like those you know baseball collusion talks that used to happen, right? When all the owners would say, okay, well, everybody, we're going to work together to drive down the prices of this. There, the drug companies sort of colluded to raise the prices. You know, and it only happened in the United States, right? Other places prices have come down significantly. In the United States, the prices have just stayed sky high. And now you're talking about for a course of treatment of most of these newer drugs that they're developing, sort of in the $100,000 a year range. And that's not even uncommon. That's like, who can even afford that kind of thing? And it's sort of tragic. And even the older drugs are priced so high that people simply can't afford it. And of course, that's where why you have shows like Breaking Bad, where the entire premise is that this guy had to sell drugs in order to afford his lung cancer treatment. It was just, uh, that's the extent. And that's how widespread it is, this sort of high prices of cancer drugs. It's a real problem. I uh, I don't know what the solution is. I mean, unless there is a sort of government interaction, uh, you know, uh, oversight perhaps, but it is a real problem. There's just no... No way Americans can actually survive if if the prices of treatment are going to be that high, especially compared to other places in the world. And I know you mentioned in Paradigm 2, when a couple of these drugs came out in the beginning, they worked really well. But overall, are the drugs for cancer a success story? Like the current drugs on the market that people are paying these big bucks for, you know, if they're willing to fork out that money, what's the success rate of using these treatments? Yeah, and that's the sort of sad part is that the initial drugs were amazing, but over the last sort of number of years, the treatment success rate has gone down so low that if you look at sort of how long they extend lives, the average was 2.1 months, which is really very little. So that is to say that if you look at, you know, and this is not to pick on one drug, but A number of drugs, let's look at all the drugs that have been developed over the last, say, 15 years and say, what is the average increase in survival that you will get from taking one of these very, very expensive drugs? And it was 2.1 months. So if you were 75 years old when you develop your cancer and you would survive to 76 with, you know, this treatment that caused a couple hundred thousand, you would survive to 76 in two months. It's like, Is that even worth it? Like, not only are you going to bankrupt everything, your quality of life may or may not be better with the treatment. And if you have to sell your house and sort of cut off your kids from their inheritance, I'm not sure that anybody would really do that. The problem is that that paradigm of genetic treatments sort of just ran into a wall so that the further developments just stopped. And this is where this third sort of paradigm really holds a significant amount of promise because if you now understand that this cancer should be viewed as a sort of a separate species, it's really something that is foreign to us, that evolved from us, but sort of speciated away, and it's caused by this chronic damage, well then the logical thing then is to say, well, let's treat it like an infection. If you boost the immune system, then you're going to be able to treat these parasites, these single cell parasites more effectively. And that's led to the development of the sort of next huge area of cancer therapeutics, which has been ongoing for about five years, six years now. So again, This paradigm has been going on for a couple of years, but it's basically immunotherapy. And that's one of the things that is where people are looking at ways to uncover the cancer and expose it to our own immune system and thinking that that's going to be a much more successful way to treat cancer. And the first couple of treatments we've had for it 
indeed there's been sort of really incredible success, maybe not as good as the first few genetic treatments, but the sort of pipeline to come looks especially promising because now we can develop these treatments and we can look at things completely differently instead of uh, going on about, you know, let's look at changing genetics. We can look at, hey, how are we going to change our points of view? How are we going to boost our immune system? And so there's been a few treatments for melanoma, for example, that has been extremely, extremely successful. It hasn't really made as big a difference, but hopefully we're just at the beginning of this paradigm shift. I mean, we're only a few years into it compared to sort of 70s to 2010, which was 40 years. So we're only sort of like five or 10 years into this new paradigm. Now I'm going to take another quick break from my chat with Jason to give a shout out to our show partner, Perfect Keto. The keto cookies from Perfect Keto are absolutely delicious. You'll question how something healthy can taste so good, but they figured it out. They come in four flavors, peanut butter, double chocolate, chocolate chip, and snickerdoodle. They're the perfect treat for your cookie cravings and have only four grams of net carbs per serving, which is two cookies. They're made with clean and real ingredients. And as a listener of the show, you get 20% off your Perfect Keto purchase by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash perfect keto. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash perfect keto. Get yourself some of the keto cookies. They make the perfect breakfast, dessert, or on-the-go snack. Now I'm going to give a shout out to our other show partner, Peak Tea. Supercharge your fasts and elevate your health with Peak Fasting Teas. These teas were formulated with the world's leading expert on intermittent fasting, which just so happens to be today's guest, Dr. Jason Fung. They'll help you fend off hunger, kick cravings to the curb, and get better results with your fasts. Feeling a little fasting hangry? These teas will help keep your hunger at bay so you can fast for longer. Plus, they contain energizing caffeine and mood-boosting botanicals that'll lift you right up out of those fasting slumps. Peak even makes a cozy caffeine-free herbal fasting tea, which is your new secret weapon for combating sugar cravings. They're triple toxin screened for purity with no prep or brewing required. Lately, I've been skipping breakfast and having Peak cinnamon herbal fasting tea in the morning with some MCT oil added in. This is a perfect addition to my healthy morning routine. As a listener of the show, you save 5% on your Peak purchase by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash peak tea. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash peak tea. And peak is spelled P-I-Q-U-E. On top of that, you get free shipping on orders over $60. If you're into time-restricted eating, give Peak Fasting Teas a try to help keep you from being hangry. And now back to my chat with Jason. Well, Jason, knowing what you know, I know there's so many different kinds of cancer and everybody has their own situation and has to make their own decision. But with the extensive knowledge you have on cancer, if you or somebody in your family was diagnosed, what path would you take? When you get the cancer, there's really, um, that's where the research has been very good. They've put a lot of money into trying to figure out the best regimens and you know, should you take this drug and this drug versus this drug and this drug? So they've put a lot of effort and money into developing the best sort of regimens of what we've got. From a treatment standpoint, I would just go with whatever the oncologist would recommend. And, and think that that's changing all the time. Where you can really start to make a difference in understanding is sort of looking at how cancer progresses and seeing if there's any way we can change it. Because you know, transformation, this cancerous transformation is only the first part of the process. After that, it still has to develop. That is, uh, you know, even if you have a cancer cell, it needs to develop. And that's one of the things that there's this sort of increasing understanding of what makes a cancer cell grow better than another. And that's, again, one of the sort of the, the environment, what part of the environment is it? And this, that comes to the real question of sort of nutrition and cancer, which is another huge and fascinating topic. <laughs> We've always known that nutrition plays a huge role in cancer. That is, in 1981, the government sort of asked a couple of very prominent cancer researchers to say, what are the causes, the known causes of cancer? So we look at something called a population attribution fraction, tobacco smoking, of the known causes of cancer was the biggest, about 35%. So 
smoking as a contributes to about 35% of all cancers that we know about. And the second one, which is very close on the heels of tobacco smoke, was diet. And way above everything else, like way above radiation, way above chemicals, way above the stuff that we worry about, like pesticides and all this sort of stuff, which is like 1% or 2%. Diet, they estimated, was about 30 to 40% of the attributable risk of cancer. So that's really interesting because then the next question, of course, was, well, if the diet is such a huge part of how cancers progress, which part of the diet is it that's important? And that's where we spent decades trying to find the answer. So the first thought was that it's fiber, like we don't eat enough fiber. And the thought was, and this is the 1970s, if you ate fiber, then you would sort of have more and bigger bowel movements. And that would sort of push out all the stuff, clean out your colon, because maybe it's the infrequent bowel movements that are allowing food to sort of rot in your gut and cause cancer. So they did all kinds of studies. And in the 2000s, what they found, of course, after three or four studies was that eating more fiber simply does not reduce your risk of cancer. So that sort of fell by the wayside. Then they said, well, maybe it's dietary fat because fat, they thought, caused everything else. They thought it caused obesity, caused heart disease. Turns out it didn't really, but that's what they thought. Never made any sense because Americans, on average, had been eating the same amount of fat as before, but didn't have any role in cancer. Certain populations, like the Inuit, ate lots of fat, like whale blubber and seal blubber. And the South Pacific Islanders ate coconut all day long, very, very high in saturated fat. And they weren't getting cancer in any particular note. So there's no reason to think that it did. But they thought, well, maybe it's the dietary fat because it does everything else bad. So they did a huge study called the Women's Health Initiative, where they randomized people to high-fat and low-fat diets. And after like 10 years, what they found was no difference. It made no difference if you ate a lot of fat or if you ate a little fat. So dietary fiber was not the answer. Dietary fat was not the answer. Then they thought, well, maybe it's some kind of vitamin deficiency because maybe you're just lacking in something. And if you replace it, you can reduce your risk of cancer. So they did A big study on beta carotene, which is what you get in carrots, the thing that makes it orange, and it's a precursor to vitamin A, which is why they say it's good for your eyes, because it's a precursor to vitamin A. And they they randomized people and vitamin and so beta carotene didn't make any difference. In fact, it seemed to make things worse. Then they looked at vitamin B, so folic acid, vitamin B12. They did a couple huge randomized trials. And by this I mean these are studies that take like 10 years and $30 $30 million and five universities to complete. They're huge trials. And they looked at vitamin B and it didn't make any difference. Actually, the people who took the vitamin B looked like they got more cancer. So the people who took vitamin A looked like they got more cancer. The people who took vitamin B looked like they got more cancer. And then they looked at vitamin C. No difference. Vitamin D was the latest one. So there's a few studies about eight or nine years ago that said, hey, vitamin D will protect you from cancer. Uh, So they did another huge trial, just came out a few years ago, maybe last year or the year before. Taking vitamin D doesn't protect you from cancer. Vitamin E, they've looked at, it doesn't protect you from cancer. Omega-3s, they looked at, it doesn't protect you from cancer. It's interesting because on the one hand, we said, well, we know that diet is a huge, plays a huge role in the causation of cancer, almost on par, like in the same neighborhood as smoking. But it wasn't fiber, it wasn't fat, and it wasn't a vitamin deficiency. And literally that costs sort of like 40 years of research to come up with those that sort of knowledge. So what the heck was it? And the answer became clear sort of in the mid-2000s because as we had this obesity epidemic, What it turns out is that obesity plays a huge role in cancer. So there are now about 13 cancers acknowledged by the World Health Organization that are obesity-related cancers, including breast cancer and colorectal cancer most prominently. 
So something like lung cancer, of course, has no, there's really very little dietary role. It's about smoking, mesothelioma, same thing. But for other cancers, we just don't know. Like, you know, certain cancers like cervical cancer, it all depends on viral infection. But breast cancer is not a viral infection. It's not a, a toxin. But it turns out that obesity is a huge, huge player in these. So the key then is to say, well, if you are overweight, then you should maintain a normal weight. And that's where proper nutrition really starts to play a role. And again, we saw this in breast cancer, for example, in Japan. A Japanese woman in Japan is relatively low. When they come to America, when they immigrate to America, their risk sort of triples within a couple of generations. You know, their food has changed and their rates of obesity have changed as well. And it may very well be the obesity, which is a hyperinsulinemic state, which is what's leading to the cancer. That is, when you eat a lot, when you have a lot of nutrients, your body wants to grow. And tipping that sort of body's mindset towards growth actually tips it more towards allowing cancers to survive and progress. It doesn't necessarily make them transform into cancers, which is a result of chronic sublethal damage. But if it does progress, it's going to give it sort of help. It's going to aid it along its journey. And that's where sort of nutrition starts to play a very, very important role in not the transformation, the cancer's transformation, but the progression of cancer. So does the research show how obese or overweight someone would have to be to really up their odds of, you know, continuing that cancer growth? It's interesting because it's probably a continuum that is the higher uh, you are in terms of your weight, the higher your risk. The actual, some of the data is quite striking because it's even like with the first sort of five pounds, which is sort of like, oh my God, that's sort of scary. But it's a continuum. So the more you're overweight, the higher risk you are. And it's probably not just your body weight, but it's probably the insulin levels. So, you know, there's a very close correlation between obesity and too much insulin in the body. Insulin is not only a metabolic hormone, but it's actually a very, very potent growth hormone. So that's why it allows uh, cells to survive. That is, if you look at the difference between breast cells they have very little insulin receptors. In breast cancer cells, they have a lot of insulin receptors. So that's one of the big differences. So if you grow breast cancer cells in the lab and you take away the insulin, those cells actually just shrivel up and die. They basically can't survive without insulin. So therefore, high levels of insulin, and especially persistently high levels of insulin, are going to allow the cancer cells to survive much better. It's probably a continuum that is the higher up on the risk scale you go, the more you are at risk of it. And it probably starts really with any type of overweight, which is a little scary, but that's what some of the research shows. That makes sense. Important information. And while we're talking about insulin, there's the insulin that spikes as we're consuming foods. And then there's the insulin that diabetics are injecting. And that plays a role in cancer too. So talk about that. Yeah, there was a few concerns because some of the large retrospective studies show that diabetics who take insulin, because now you're exposing themselves to more insulin, you know, there's a lot of danger that that insulin is going to promote cancer. And there's a lot of these uh, data that show that that unfortunately looks like the case. Some of the data is inconsistent because the other data show, oh, there's no increased risk of cancer. But the problem is, of course, cancer is a disease that develops over 10 or 15 or 20 years. It doesn't develop sort of right away. That is, if, if you're overweight as a 15-year-old, you don't just immediately get breast cancer. You get breast cancer at like age 50. It's a lifetime of sort of increased risk, which leads you to that in amongst a lot of other stuff like aging and all that kind of stuff. So these sort of studies where people have said, well, we did this randomized study where we gave people insulin and they didn't get more cancer. It's like, well, you're doing it for like two years, three years. And it's really going to be hard to say if it actually increases your risk substantially over that period of time. So I would be very leery of that. I, I think that there is a very real risk there, but that's one of many things. If of course, you do lose weight. If you are a type 2 diabetic, not type 1 diabetic, because remember, type 1 diabetic, 
have low insulin levels. So they're trying to replace, they're taking insulin to sort of replace their normal insulin levels. Whereas type 2 diabetics have actually exceedingly high levels of insulin in their body, and you're giving more. So that's a bad thing. That is, if you have too much insulin, you shouldn't be taking more insulin. You should be trying to take less insulin, as opposed to type 1s who have too little insulin, therefore taking a little bit of insulin is normal. So for type 2, of course, if you try to maintain a normal weight, very often that diabetes will actually get significantly better, often to the point where you don't have to take insulin. And we have more options in terms of medications as well. Interesting. Good distinction there between type 1 and type 2. And earlier we talked about metastasis. I want to come back to this. This is where cancer is leaving from the primary tumor, traveling through the body to a new site, and setting up base and and growing a new tumor in a new location. So let's talk about when that happens, because it doesn't happen in all cases. So what gets cancer to that point where metastasis occurs and why? You know, I found this part sort of the most interesting because it's probably the most important because metastasis is really what kills people. I think that for a lot of years, the way that people thought of it is that metastasis is a very late process. So say you have a breast cancer, it has to be there for a number of years, it grows, it grows, it grows, and eventually it gets big enough that it breaks off. So say after 10 years, it breaks off and then goes to the liver. So the question is, how does it do that? Because the environment in the liver is extremely different than the environment in the breast. So how can a cell that normally survives in the breast all of a sudden survive in the liver? It's almost impossible to do. It's like humans going to Mars and just walking out and, you know, it's like, oh, here we go. It's like, you're going to die. So that was the sort of question as to why that happens, how it happens. And again, the evolutionary sort of paradigm sort of explains this process in a very interesting and much more consistent way with the data. That is, it's not that the cancer just grows and grows and grows and then suddenly breaks off after 10 or 15 years. It probably is breaking off all the time. And what happens is that the body just wipes it out. So breast cancer, even from before you can detect it, is shedding these cancer cells into the blood, millions of these cancer cells into the blood. But almost immediately, they're getting wiped out. And the immune system kills them. The bloodstream is very fast and it's a very different environment. Some of them may land in the liver or the brain, but can't survive there because it's simply too foreign an environment for this breast cell which lands in the brain, it's like, whoa, I'm used to the breast. And all of a sudden it's like, whoa, what is all this, right? Uh, Or lands in the lung and it's like, what's all this air blowing in and out, right? This is crazy. So these cells don't survive and they get wiped out almost immediately, but they evolve. And this is what's sort of really fascinating about the evolutionary paradigm is that it starts to explain how metastasis happens. So the technology has evolved to the point that we can actually detect these low-volume cancer cells in the blood. So they're called circulating tumor cells, and this is what some people call a liquid biopsy. That is, you could take actually some blood and look for cancer cells, very, very minutely small quantities of these cancer cells because they're actually getting destroyed immediately upon leaving the breast tumor. So the estimates are they survive maybe an hour at the most before they're all dead. So that's why they're so hard to detect. And we were not able to detect these early, early metastatic cells before. But now it explains how cancers develop and how metastases develop. Because basically now we have, uh, say you take this breast cancer, continuously shedding off cells. Well, all of a sudden, One day, this breast cancer has mutated, and it just is able to survive a little bit longer in the blood. The bloodstream, for example, the dangers that that are in the bloodstream now acts as a selective pressure for evolutionary change. That is, these cells, which are now able to survive, they survive long enough to get back to the original breast cancer site, the breast tumor. Now, their progeny are going to be just a little bit more likely to survive the bloodstream. 
So maybe instead of all million cells dying, you have one cell that makes it. But that one cell comes back and it propagates itself. So maybe the next time two or three cells are able to survive and that just keeps going. So this process of metastasis is not a late stage thing. It's actually a very early, early, early process, which is what contributes to the evolution of this tumor as it goes year after year, because remember these tumors often develop after many, many years, is that it keeps evolving, keeps evolving, keeps evolving. And by the time you see it, there's subclones of cells. So some had developed from the sort of early tumor, some had developed from later. So it's interesting because when you actually do a biopsy of these cancers, you can find multiple subclones. It's not one single clone of cell. And the metastatic site, if you have a breast cancer and you take a biopsy and it's metastasized to the liver and you take a biopsy from the liver, those two sites are actually quite different from each other. Genetically, they're different because you've had different evolutionary pressures in the liver. That is, as they were trying to survive, they faced different is a different environment in the liver compared to the breast. So therefore, it was facing different evolutionary selection pressures, and it's evolved in a completely different way. So that metastatic site has evolved differently from the original site. And that sort of um, process explains a lot of what uh, we see is things like cancers with unknown primaries, why some people will, will uh, survive for 20 years with no cancer, and then it will suddenly come back because all that time it's been sort of evolving, evolving, evolving. So we thought that these cancers lay dormant, but they don't. They're actually continuously changing as they go. And again, if you understand that there are different ways that you can apply that knowledge to change treatment, for example, you may not need to apply what's known as maximally tolerated dose. That is the standard way to apply chemotherapy is to give as much chemotherapy as you can without killing the patient. That's basically maximum tolerated dose. But maybe you don't need that because what's going to happen when you give maximum dose is that that is now going to act as a selection pressure for the development of resistance. So maybe you don't need that. Maybe you can give a smaller dose over a longer period of time and just control it rather than eradicate it. So that's something called adaptive therapy, which is one of these sort of new ways of treating cancer, which we would never have come across if we are on that sort of older paradigm of genetic disease. Now with an evolutionary paradigm, we're like, hey, this makes sense because we have a whole branch of science, evolutionary biology, and we can apply these lessons, which we've actually learned already, to the cancer problem and come up with all these innovative new treatments, immune therapy, adaptive therapy, you know, there's so many other ways that you could go. When cancer is leaving that primary site and spreading through the body, is it doing that to get better access to resources or why is it doing that? It's just the way that it is because that's the way single-celled organisms are. They, they shed, they move around, right? I mean, if you think about uh, viruses and bacteria and stuff, they're constantly looking for better places to go. And it doesn't matter. So what they do, of course, you know, you have a, say, a bacteria or a fungus or something. It grows and grows, and then it's very mobile, right? It likes to move around. So therefore, it just sort of flies off, you know, it, it moves all over the place, looks for better niches of uh, to exploit. That's just part of the way that unicellular organisms operate, as opposed to cells in a multicellular organism like the, you know, a normal liver cell. It has adhesion molecules that stick it to the liver, right? It cannot move. It's bound down really tight to that spot so that it can't move, as opposed to single-celled organisms, which actually try to get around as much as they can. In the book, you talk about how intermittent fasting can be used as a therapy to help prevent cancer. Talk about how that would work. And there's not a lot of data in this uh, area, but what we know is that obesity is a big risk factor for cancer. And therefore, if you can maintain a normal weight, then you're presumably going to lower your risk of these obesity-related cancers substantially. 
intermittent fasting is one of the ways that people have used to maintain a normal weight, which is very interesting. The other thing is uh, the only other place in uh, fasting in cancer, you know, some people use fasting during chemotherapy to lower the side effects, which is also interesting because fasting, what it does is it puts your body in a sort of a low growth mode. So it moves the body from sort of a growth mode into sort of a, a repair regeneration mode. And because chemotherapy is a poison that attacks rapidly growing cells, by kind of putting your cells into a more dormant state, you can actually try to lower the side effects that you're going to get from chemotherapy. So that's been used in several studies and has been reasonably effective at, you know, at changing uh, some people's um, response. So if you're able to tolerate the chemotherapy, then of course, you're going to be able to take the drug better, which is going to hopefully lead to better anti-cancer effect. You also talk about consuming green tea. Is that from a treatment perspective or from a preventative? It's from a preventative standpoint. So this is something called chemo prevention. And um, there are not a lot of drugs that have been well studied for chemo prevention. The diabetes drug metformin has been used. And then the only other thing that sort of has a little bit of data, but not a lot, is green tea. And it's felt that some of the antioxidants and the catechins that you get in green tea help prevent against cancer. So there's a lot of sort of data from Japan where they do drink a lot of this green tea. And it shows that perhaps it may have an anti-cancer effect. So it's not a very strong effect. But on the other hand, green tea is relatively harmless. We don't really think that anybody has any, you know, bad effects from drinking green tea. It's a traditional sort of uh, food that can be consumed in a very high um, dose, and it's not very expensive. So from that standpoint, it's been used quite a bit. And so therefore, it's got potential as a uh, sort of uh, adjunct to sort of chemo prevention. Well, Jason, I love the new book, The Cancer Code. It's just so comprehensive. I can tell you put your whole heart and soul into this book. And I want to thank you for coming back on the show. Oh, thank you. How can the listeners connect with you after the show? Uh, Yeah, so they can go to my website, which is thefastingmethod.com, or they can follow me on Twitter or social media. It's at Dr. Jason Fung. That's D-R Jason Fung. They can find me there. It's all going to be linked up over in the show notes. And Jason, any final thoughts before we part ways? I think the only other thing is that this is, uh, you know, it's such an interesting topic. And I'm hoping that, you know, people who who are suffering from cancer are just interested, actually gain a bit of perspective into the ways that the the entire field is changing, because I don't see a lot of people talking about it. A lot of people sort of stuck in that old sort of thinking. And it's, we need to move to this sort of new way of thinking if we're going to develop new treatments and sort of ways to help people more. So I hope that this uh, spurs development in that sort of area. It's going to be fascinating over the next five and 10 years to see how cancer research continues to unfold and and where treatments go. Yeah, agreed. Thanks again, Jason. Okay, thank you so much. Such powerful and important information. And like I said at the beginning, if you know somebody in your life that could benefit from this, please share the episode along. We'd love to connect with you over on Instagram. You can tag drjasonfung and at Ultimate Health Podcast. You can take a screenshot of the player as you're listening Take a short video clip of yourself or a picture, and we'd love to connect with you over there. For full show notes, head over to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash 380. There's links there to everything we discussed today and so much more. Be sure and check those out. And before I let you go, I want to give some love to my editor and engineer, Jace Sanderson over at podcasttech.com. Thank you, Jace. And this week's fun fact is that we've uploaded our first interview clips to our YouTube channel. There's much more video content to come, so be sure and head over there. Watch and subscribe, and you can do that over at ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash YouTube. Have an awesome week. I'll talk to you soon. Wishing you ultimate health.